כן? כן? יש מעלה. Oma Gyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Ghoravani Precharine Nirvise Shashanyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita Nam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Kadhadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So we welcome everyone to our study of uh, Srimad Bhagavatam, Third Canto, Kapila Shiksha at the level of bhakti vaibhav, right? And we're on, here you can see, chapter 29. Explanation of devotional service by Lord Kapila. So we have our over, overview. The chapter begins with Devahuti inquiring from Lord Kapila. She's got different questions to put. And then Lord Kapila will explain about how bhakti is practiced in different degrees according to the practitioner, how he's affected by the modes of nature. And then we will hear about nirguna bhakti, bhakti free from the modes. Then the chapter goes on to describe about the results of different devotional practices. And then we will hear about how to deal respectfully with all different living beings. And this is quite an important topic. Uh, dealing with people, all living entities, in a respectful manner. P particularly, it's important in deity worship. And then we'll hear about the different gradations of living entities. And by following Lord Kapila's instruction, you can go back to Godhead. The, we'll hear about the effects of time. Devahuti inquired about time. She wanted to hear about time. Okay, so oh, that's, that's it. 45 verses, quite a big chapter. Okay, so the chapter begins with Devahuti's inquiry. Right. Who would like to read for us? You can just read the English. Devahuti inquired. Yeah, please go on. Right. Okay, Hare Krishna, Maharaj, and Mahatma. Um, Devahuti inquired, My dear Lord, you have already very scientifically described the symptoms of the total material nature and the characteristics of the spiritual, of the spirit, according to Vishant. Sankhya system of philosophy. Now I shall request you to explain the path of devotional service, which is the ultimate end of all philosophical systems. Okay. So you can see we've highlighted her real question there. She wants Lord Kapila to explain to her the path of devotional service. That's what we're going to be hearing about. Yes? Someone else read? Explain in detail the path of bhakti, which is the root cause of the knowledge of Sankhya and the ultimate end of all philosophical systems. So explain in detail the path of bhakti. So this, this is discussed and it's going to be answered in this chapter. Verses 7 to 34, we will hear about the path of bhakti. 
is going to come up in this chapter, immediately after her questions have finished. Go ahead, Maharaj, keep reading. Describe about the nature of time by whose fear, fear people uh, perform pious acts. And this is answered also in this chapter, at the end of the chapter. The last ten verses we'll hear about the effects of time. I think it also goes on into the next chapter. Yes, go ahead, Maharaji. Describe about the uh, continual process of birth and death of the jivas, hearing which one becomes detached. And that will be answered in chapters 30, 31 and 32. We will hear about the process of birth and death. We'll hear about death in the different modes and what happens at the time of death. And we'll hear about birth also and what birth is like. So a lot of information there <laughs> coming up in the next unit. 31, chapters 30, 31 and 32. A lot of practical knowledge. All right, someone else read please. Bhakti Yoga, Bhakti is the heart of Sankhya. Bhakti Yoga is the basic principle of all systems of philosophy. All philosophy which does not aim for devotional service to the Lord is considered merely mental speculation. But of course, Bhakti Yoga with no philosophical basis is more or less sentiment. Right. What does it, Prabhupada says? Religion without philosophy is... What does Prabhupada say? Uh, religion without philosophy is sentiment. Sentiment. And philosophy without religion? Mental speculation. All right. So here, Prabhupada is saying you have philosophy. You may have philosophy. You don't have men, you don't, if you don't have devotional service, then it's simply speculation. So this is confirmed here in this statement. Bhakti yoga with no philosophy is more or less sentiment. So the bhakti yoga is the religion, but if you have no philosophy, it's just sentiment. So this is what Prabhupada commonly said. There should be both philosophy and religion. The, the highest philosophy is religion with the religion. Okay, we're going ahead to hear more. Lord Kapila was very satisfied by the request of his glorious mother because she was thinking not only in terms of her personal salvation, but in terms of all the fallen conditioned souls. So this was very pleasing to Lord Kapila. Devahuti's inquiries were very nice. Yes? Someone read? The Lord is always... Yes, Okay. The Lord is always compassionate towards the fallen souls of the material world, this material world, and therefore he comes himself or sends his confidential servants to deliver them. Since he is perpetually compassionate towards them, if some of his devotees also become compass compassionate towards them, he is very pleased with the devotees. Uh, right. In the 18th chapter, Lord Krishna says, Nachatasman Manusheshu Kashinme Priyakritama. There's no one more dear to me than the one who is teaching also this message, this knowledge of devotional service. So this is appreciated by the Lord. The Lord Himself comes to teach, and if the devotee also takes up this work on behalf of the Lord, then the Lord is very pleased with the devotees. You want to please the Lord, take up that work, teaching, preaching, yeah? 
Now, we're going to hear now about the different classes of bhakti, different love, different manners in which people may perform their devotional service. Actually, the path of devotional service is one without a second. But according to the devotee's condition, devotional service appears in multifarious varieties, as will be nicely explained in the following verses. Right? Devotional service appears in different varieties. It's, we'll see devotion in ignorance, passion and goodness, as well as nirguna bhakti. This described here. So first of all, devotional service in the mode of ignorance. Who would like to read? Devotional service in the mode of ignorance. Devotional service executed by a person who is envious, proud, violent and angry and who is a separatist is considered to be in the mode of darkness. All right, we should note, it's the person who's in the mode of ignorance. And the person, he may be doing devotional service, but because he's in the mode of ignorance, so the activities are influenced. So in the mode of ignorance, a person may have these kind of characteristics, envious, proud, violent, angry, a separatist, One, angry. Two, devoid of compassion. Three, worships the Lord with intentions of violence, pride and hatred. People do these things. They worship the deity with that kind of motive. They want to do harm to someone. Of course, pride, that's, that's, that could be very, it's very common. Oh, look at me, I'm worshipping the deity. You see, I'm very... I'm very religious, I'm very, I'm very pure, I'm on the altar with the deity. <laughs> so we, we have to be careful of these kind of uh, moods. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur gives us an important commentary. Who would like to read? One should not say that bhakti becomes tamasic. Rather, the particular person in question is tamasic. He is angry. He does not see happiness and distress equally in himself and others. Bhinna In other words, he is without compassion. With a goal of violence, pride and hatred, the angry person with no compassion who performs bhakti, bhavam, to me is tamasic. Tamasic. If we do devotional service in that kind of mood, you know, and it, it often happens. We, actually, we see it. You know, maybe you've been doing some managing with devotees and you have to ask someone, uh, you have to say, Prabhu, would you mind to do the RT? And the, the person goes, oh, me? Oh, why I have to do it, you know? Or you say, Prabhu, would you be able to go in the kitchen and cook the offering? Oh no, you always come to me when somebody doesn't come. Well, Prabhu, the marriage is off the altar, you know. We need somebody to cook the offering. Yeah, but why do you always come to me, you know? And like that, we have a very kind of a grudging mood. Not very pure motivation, you know. <laughs> and sometimes it's much worse. Sometimes, you know, hatred. That's really, you know, when, uh, you know, I hate to do this. I hate to, <laughs> or I hate this person. I have to work with this person. I hate them. So then sometimes you're angry. It's really not the right mood to be doing devotional service. And so we may do service, but there's no real devotion or, or the devotion is has become influenced. The person is in ignorance. Bhakti itself may not be in ignorant, ignorance, but the activities themselves are pure. But because of our consciousness, the manner in which we do them, 
tamasic influence. Go ahead, keep reading Prabhu. The worship of deities in the temple by a separatist with a motive for material enjoyment, fame and opulence is devotion in the mode of passion. All right. Have you seen this before? I'm sure you've seen it a lot. Worship in the temple by a separatist with a motive for material enjoyment. More specifically, fame and opulence. He wants to be known. Oh, he's the pujari. Oh, he did the arti. Oh, and opulence. How will he get opulence? Well, maybe he's thinking by worshipping the deity, Krishna will reward him. So, that is devotion in the mode of passion. We don't worship the deities with a pure motive. We're thinking, what will I get? What will I gain from this service? So, this is not the proper mood to perform devotional service. And then, go ahead Prabhu. Worship. Worships the Lord with the desire for other objects, with goals of material gain, fame or wealth. Okay. Yeah, we want some profit, adoration and distinction, generally. Lab puja pratishta. <laughs> these are the things, these are the enemies, these are the anarthas, which we want to be very careful to try to remove. Yes, go ahead, Prabhu. The word separatist must be understood carefully. The Sanskrit word in this connection are bhinna druk and prutak bhava. A separatist is one who sees his interest as separate from that of Supreme Lord. Mixed devotee or devotee in the mode of passion and ignorance think that the interest of the Supreme Lord is supplying the order of the devotee. <laughs> Can you imagine? They think that the interest of the Lord is to supply the orders of the devotee. The devotee wants to tell the Lord what he wants and the Lord is supposed to fulfill all his desires. And so that is a very uh, unfortunate situation. The person in that condition is influenced by the modes of nature. Although he may be engaged in devotional service, his devotion is influenced by the modes of nature, the lower modes, passion and ignorance. And it's not very good to be in that condition. Oh yes, there's a bit more Prabhu. The interest of such devotee is to draw from the Lord as much as possible from their sense gratification. This is separatist mentality. Mayavadi, however, interpret this word separatist in a different way. They say that while worshipping the Lord, one should think himself one with the Supreme Lord. This is another adulterated form of devotion within the mode of material nature. Mm. And so we see how the Mayavadi, how they interpret the word in a very different manner. And they say that it's, we should think ourselves one with the Lord. When we worship the Lord, we should think of ourselves as being one with Him. So this is also an adulterated form of devotion. This is not pure devotion. Mm. So they, they interpret the word like that. Oh, we should think of ourselves as one, with, one should think himself one with the Lord. But Prabhupada is explaining the Vaishnava interpretation of the word separatist, that we have a, mood, a, a, a motive different from that of the Lord. We're not just in thinking of what the Lord wants. We bring our own desires. So this is the modes of nature. So this 
separatist mentality is very important. It should be understood carefully. What is the separatist mentality? Again, you can see, we explained it here, that he sees the interest, his interest as separate from that of the Supreme Lord. And of course we think our interest is more important than that of the Lord. Okay, go ahead Prabhu, keep reading. When a devotee worships the Supreme Personality of Godhead and offers the result of his activities in order to free himself from the inhibitories of fruitive activities, his devotion is in mode of goodness. All right, yeah, that's the mode of goodness. You worship in the mode of goodness. What does he want? He wants to get free of his bad karma. He wants to get free of the bad reaction. Maybe we're thinking, you know, before I became a devotee, I did a lot of nonsense. I want to get rid of all my bad karma. I want to nullify, take away all my karma, so I will do this devotional service. Get free from the inhibitories of fruit of activities, karmic activities. We want to get free from the results of all of our karma. So, do devotional service. If, we, if our motive is like that, that is also not pure devotion, but that is devotion in the mode of goodness. Yes? Worships the Lord with a desire to destroy karma and makes his work as an offering to the Lord. Worships as a matter of duty and fourthly, to achieve liberation. <laughs> if we're doing the devotional service just to get liberation, then that is also the mode of goodness. That is not pure devotion. Oh, I want liberation, just give me mukti. So is everyone clear about this? Very important, understand this. Worship in the mode of goodness. There are four things described there, a desire to destroy karma, an offering, makes his work as an offering to the Lord, worships as a matter of duty, and worships to achieve liberation. So this is all the mode of goodness. All right. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Who will... Okay, let's have another person read. Read the verse. Not the Sanskrit, just the verse. Translation. The manifestation of unadulterated devotional service is exhibited when one's mind is at once attracted to hearing the transcendental name and qualities of the Supreme Personality of Godhead who is residing in everyone's heart. Just as the water of Ganges flows naturally down towards the ocean. Such devotional ecstasy, uninterrupted by any material condition, flows towards the Supreme Law. All right, so now we're hearing about Nirguna Bhakti, or pure devotional service, or uh, described here, unadulterated devotional service. One's mind is at once attracted to hearing the transcendental name and qualities of Krishna. So that is the sign of, at once the mind is attracted, you want to hear. And the example is given, just as the water of the Ganges flows down to the ocean. So that is, that, that kind of devotional ecstasy, uninterrupted by any material condition, flows towards the Supreme Lord. Hmm, right? We, there's many verses like that in the scriptures. Right? Remember, just as uh, the Ganges flows forever to the sea, what does Queen Kunti say? Tvayime Ganga Vishaya Vidurma. Huh? Who knows the verse? Tvayime Ganga Vishaya Matir Madhu Pate Sakrit. As the Ganges forever 
flows to the sea. Let my attraction be, born, be drawn to you in the same spontaneous way. Right? Who knows the verse? Nobody. You studied Queen Kunti, you didn't learn this verse? Yes? Nobody going to tell me. All right, characteristics of pure bhakti beyond the modes. What, is it, what are the features of pure bhakti? First of all, bhakti is beyond the gunas. It's not influenced by the modes of nature. It's not influenced by even goodness. It's above even goodness. And then the absence of results other than bhakti. Absence of results other than bhakti. The only thing you get from bhakti is bhakti. We don't want anything else. We just want more devotion. We're not looking for anything. We have no material desires. And then the lack of obstructions from other processes. Other processes like jnana and karma or meditation, these things then they can obstruct us, they can obstruct our devotion. But if we just do devotion, then there's no problem. Devotees do not accept any kind of liberation unless it involves service to Krishna. A devotee doesn't want liberation. He just simply wants devotional service. Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has taught us in the Shikshastikam. He didn't want wealth or followers or, or praise by beautiful poetry. He simply wanted devotional service, birth after birth. So he was not interested in liberation. A devotee does not desire any kind of liberation unless there's an opportunity to do service to Krishna. So this is the highest state of existence, which surpasses the three gunas and attains prema for Lord Kapila or Lord Krishna. Okay, going ahead. Avicinina, without interruption, no material condition can stop the flow of devotional service of a pure devotee, as the flow of the Ganga cannot be stopped by any condition. So devotional service should be like that. Ahaitiki apritihata yayatma suprasidati. Right? Must be unmotivated and uninterrupted. So here, without interruption, that is one characteristic of pure devotion. And then ahaitiki means without reason. Right? We had that already in the first canto, second chapter, Sabai Pum Sam Paro Dharma. Right? Mentioned Ahaitiki Apratiyata. So here different words are used. And then Avaya Vahita means without cessation. So we had without interruptions, this is without cessation. A pure devotee must the Lord 24 hours a day without cessation. His life is so molded that at every minute and every second he engages in some sort of devotional service. So how are you going to do this? Do you get to sleep? Are you allowed to sleep? Yes. Huh? Who, who's going to answer? Yes, Madhiji? Yes, Maharaj, we are allowed to sleep. But we can sleep in the proper proper time. Prabhu, sorry. Um, we can sleep in the proper time and wake up for Mangal Arati. Yes. Don't, not so long. Don't sleep, so long. Too, don't sleep too much, right? Don't sleep yes. too little, don't sleep too much. But just sleep enough. To do what? Best body 
So you can serve Krishna better. Yes, right. So that you can serve Krishna better the next day. Right. You have to do, be able to do your service the next day. All right. And then another meaning Krishna. of the word avyaya vahita is that the interest of the devotee and the interest of the Supreme Lord are on the same level. The devotee has no interest but to fulfill the transcendental desire of the Supreme Lord. So one in interest, Srila Prabhupada often talks about that, he said this is real oneness, the interest, one in interest, and Prabhupada would give the example about the family, how a family have the common interest, they're all interested for the well-being of the family. There may be the father and the sons, and they all have the common interest, they want to benefit the family. So here also, the Lord and his devotees, the common interest, the devotee has no interest separate from the Lord. If his interest is separate from the Lord, then he's a separatist, right? And we're hearing that separatists, they're in the modes of nature. All right? Going ahead, text number 13. Right? A devotee, someone read? Maharaj, can I ask a quick question, if that's okay? Okay, yeah, we'll have a question. Maharaj, you know, uh, in prior chapters we mentioned that devotional service is beyond liberation. The practice of devotional service, uh, liberation is achieved automatically. So here we discussed, uh, you know, the, uh, in the mode of ignorance, passion and goodness. So, uh, I mean, I was just thinking if, if Bhakti's practice in passion or ignorance and liberation can't be at a very, very high level of spiritual advancement. And then second part was, if liberation is not considered to be that high in terms of your spiritual advancement, um, how come do we refer to like Srila Prabhupada and the Acharyas as... Hare, Hare Krishna? Yes, I do. I think you are. Mike is. Thank you. So, Maharaj, sorry, again, the second part of the question was in liberation is not considered to be at such a high level, how come do we refer to Srila Prabhupada and the Acharyas as eternally liberated souls? Let's try to understand this. Well, you have to understand that when we talk about devotee being liberated, that means he has to be performing pure devotional service. If we're doing devotional service in the modes of nature, then you can, you're not liberated. It's no question of liberation in the mode, if you're doing service in the mode of passion or ignorance. You're not going, there's no question, it's not that they're different, not a very high level of liberation, <laughs> no. There's no question, there's, that, there's, we don't hear that. Oh, not a very high level of, there's no such thing. You're either liberated or not. And if you're doing service in the modes, you're not liberated. Because service in the modes, it means the person's in the modes of nature. You, ha you have to do devotional service. There has to be pure devotional service. So when Bhagavad Gita speaks about devotional service, it's not talking about just any old devotional service. It's devotional service which is, what, which is above the modes. That's my understanding anyway. You have to transcend the modes of nature to actually come. You have to transcend the modes of nature to actually get the benefit of devotional service. Okay, thank you, Maharaj. My, my doubt just kept in, you know, when we discussed that when you come to devotional service, uh, it was mentioned that you're already liberated. <laughs> you know, so that's why I'm now going through these three different uh, modes. It made me question. Well, that, theoretically, know. theoretically you're liberated. Yes, if you're doing, you've come to devotional service, you take up devotional service with a pure motive. That, but if you're coming with some other motive, then yeah, it's, it's not going to be this effective. It's not going to work. What is your motive in coming? Do you, are you coming simply for the the service of Krishna, simply to 
to, to try to please Krishna and to engage in the loving service of Krishna? Are we coming for our own motive? Are we looking to get something from the Lord? We have other our material desires. So our service is influenced by the modes. And Prabhupada would often say it's not so easy thing to become a Vaishnava, to become a devotee. It's not so easy thing. We're trying to become, but still we're influenced by the modes. And, and if, uh, even our devotional service is influenced by the modes. So we're, we're not going to get the same result. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna said, Mamcha yo vaya bicharina, bhakti yogena sevate, sagunam samati chaikam, brahma buyaya kalpate. So liberation means to come to the Brahma Buddha stage, to have transcended the modes of nature. But what do you have to do to come? To, you have to perform devotional service without falling down. It mentions here that one who engages my devotional service without falling down, without deviation, then he transcends the modes of nature, comes to the level of Brahman. So there are some qualifications here. It's not so just, oh, anybody who comes and does any service, they're liberated. No, you have to come to the level of proper devotional service, just like chanting the holy name. You know, there's qualities in chanting the holy name. Not everybody gets the benefit of destroying all their sinful reactions. Now, if you chant the holy name, Nama Parad, you don't get, you don't get rid of all your sinful reactions, do you? Hmm? No, Maharaj, no. And so, you don't. So that's devotional service. You see, the, the devotional service is chanting the holy name also. And it's there's qualities in it and we have to have it has to be pure the motivation has to be pure to get the real benefit from devotional service so we're hearing we're hearing these things this is to make us aware of these things to bring us to a higher level of devotion yes I've got a proper understanding of this Maharaj thank you very much Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, may I ask a question from the previous slide, Maharaj? Okay. What, this one? Yeah, actually in this one, uh, it is mentioned that uh, absence of results other than bhakti and lack of obstructions from other processes. So lack of obstructions uh, from other processes, actually I am unable to understand uh, which processes actually are being referred to. Well, if we're doing other, you know, other processes like karma, jnana, karma yoga, jnana yoga, you know, then the, the, there will be some kind of uh, jnana yoga, you know, you, 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 you've got knowledge, you're thinking about knowledge, you're cultivating jnana, and karma yoga, there's a lot of detachment there, you want to try to get detached from the results of the work, you know. It's, it, you can get caught up in these kind of things. These Basically the paths of karma, jnana and uh, yoga. Yes. Okay. These are Basically the, this, this pure bhakti is referred to as nirgun bhakti Maharaj? Yes. Okay, okay Maharaj. Thank you Maharaj. Alright, going ahead, text 13. Please read someone. Uh, shall, shall I read uh, Maharaj? Uh, All right, yeah, please read, yeah. The shloka also and the... Uh, no, I'll just read the... Okay. The... Okay, a pure devotee does not accept any kind of liberation, salokya, sarishti, samipya, sarupya, or ekatva, even though they are offered by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. All right, so, what is this salokya? Uh, shall I say, Maharaj? Yes. To enter the same planet uh, as that of the Supreme Lord. Right. And Sarshti means? Uh, to have the opulence, uh, same opulence as that of the Supreme Lord. And sa Samipya? To have, uh, to become a personal associate of the Supreme Lord. Okay. And Sarupya? 
to have the same form which is uh, the form of the supreme lord and what about ekatva to merge in the brahma jyoti the brahman effulgence mm -hmm. so pure devotee is not interested there are five different kinds of liberation we see these five different kinds of liberation are there uh, but even they're offered by the supreme lord the pure devotee will not accept them unless there's the opportunity for devotional service. So these five kinds of liberation, uh, they, a devotee will never accept a katva under any condition because there's no opportunity for devotional service. But the other four, the devotee may accept them if there's the opportunity for devotional service. If the Lord is telling him, no, you should take it, you should go. You should go to my abode like that. So a devotee may take it. Okay? So next section, devotional practices for the purification of the mind. We do want to purify our mind, right? So it's described in text 15 to 18. A devotee must execute his prescribed duties which are glorious without material profit. Without excessive violence, one should regularly perform one's devotional activities. <laughs> right? So, prescribed duties. A devotee must execute his prescribed duties. We have different prescribed duties, just like Grihastas, you have certain duties to perform. And there will be different, sometimes there will be emergency things. Whatever we are required to do, you have to maintain your family, of course, you have to do these things. But we do them without thinking about material profit. And then excessive violence. We should be very careful to avoid that. Unnecessarily violence. We get angry, we lose our temper, we become violent. It's very bad, very dangerous for a devotee. Characteristic of a devotee should be that their mind is peaceful and pure. We shouldn't get angry, be violent. <laughs> One time, there, there, was a, there was a young couple living in a house next door to some other people and the other people co complained to the devotees, they said, you know, we were surprised. We, the, the young couple came to live there and we saw that they were devotees going to Hare Krishna temple. But we'd hear them argue all the time, very violently arguing and shouting at each other and screaming. We wondered what was going on. We thought they were supposed to be peaceful people. And they were devotees. They go to the temple and they dress like devotees. But when they're at home, they were so violent and arguing and screaming and fighting with each other. So that's not the behavior, not the proper behavior of devotee. So we have to perform proper devotional activities and we should be very careful about these things, about violence. All right, someone can read this for us. Chandrika, can you read for us? Yes, Maharaj. Even if a devotee has to commit violence, it should not be done beyond what is necessary. Arjuna engaged in the art of killing, and although killing, killing is, of course, violence, he killed the enemy simply on Krishna's order. In the same way, if we commit violence as it is necessary by the order of the Lord, that is called not himself. We cannot avoid violence, for we are put into a conditional life in which we have to commit violence, but we should not commit more violence than necessary or than ordered by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Okay, so how do we understand this? We cannot avoid violence, for we, have, for we are put into a conditioned life in which we have to commit violence. Chandrika, can you comment on this? Uh, I can try, Maharaj. Um, uh, 
from the purpose I read, show um, Prabhupada purpose, uh, I understood that um, uh, he gives this example that we also have to kill plants to to have uh, food, but uh, this is the arrangement that that uh, Krishna gave for people for human beings, and this is the right violence. It's also violence, but uh, um, it's necessary violence. Oh. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mary G. Very nice. Uh, Maharaj, uh, Maharaj, can I try? Yes, please. Uh -huh. Maharaj, like a uh, uh, mother, she scolds her child not to do, uh, if he does not do proper things that way. So it is, it, it should be in a proper mode, like to benefit, like, uh, and the same thing with Hanuman. Hanumanji, he, uh, like, with his, uh, with his, uh, like he burnt the uh, this um, Ravan's empire, but he did not burn the uh, Ashokvatika and uh, uh, Vishnu's house that way. So that way it is in a uh, with the right violence, in a, done in a proper way. Well, uh, you know, I question you about this business with the child. You get violent with the child. <laughs> <laughs> Prabhupada, Prabhupada said you're not allowed to hit the children. Not hitting, like suppose if you're scolding a child that way. Oh, scolding. Like if you're not doing a proper, proper just, thing. Just a verbal chastisement. Yeah, verbal. No physical violence. Huh? <laughs> yes, ma'am. And Prabhupada said you can show them the stick and threaten, but you cannot use it. <laughs> you cannot slap a child. Right. You, you, you can't use a stick. You can, th you can show it. You say, I'll, I'll beat you. <laughs> and, uh, but you never use it. Right? So, yes, uh, like that. Uh, uh, we see some extremes, like other people, they, the, the extremes which they go to to avoid violence. We see, for example, that Ahimsa Jain, they will wear Ahimsa silk. You know, what is it? Digamba? Uh, uh, swat swatamba. Swatamba Jains, uh, they wear ahimsa silk cloth, they wait for the, the silkworm to die, and then when the silkworm dies a natural death, then only they take the cocoon and they make the cloth. And then they will sweep the road, and they always wear a mask. Nowadays everyone's wearing masks because of COVID, but even before COVID, the Jains would always wear a face mask over their mouth, and they will filter the water before they drink water, in Buddhism also is a bit like that, because in Buddhism, they, they, for them, the ultimate religious principle is ahimsa. And they consider ahimsa to be the highest principle of religion, but Prabhupada explains that ahimsa is a sub-religious sub principle. It's not the highest principle of religion. Rather, the highest principle of religion is to develop love of God. But Buddhism and Jain and so on, they have no concept of God. And for them, they just practice the more, they're cultivating more the mode of goodness and avoid violence and sweep the road and do things like that. Um, Lama, the Lama Buddhism, they will also, they will break the earth and they will make sure there's no worms or anything in the earth before they use the earth to Bake, make a brick to build, put up a building, and they do things like this. So they go to extremes to practice non-violence, but Prabhupada said here we cannot avoid violence. Just like you're walking, when you walk somewhere, sometimes there will be some insects. Of course, we will try to avoid the insects if there are insects on the path, but sometimes you can't. And sometimes you may be driving, you may be driving in a car and sometimes, you know, a bird may fly into the car or something and you, you, you may be responsible for some kind of violence like that. Difficult to avoid all violence. So Prabhupada said we cannot really avoid it. But we have to use everything for the service of Krishna. That is the point, that if we're walking for the service of Krishna, and we're driving the car for Krishna, to go for Krishna's service, then you're not going to get karma for it. So, 
that's the idea. You can avoid karmic reaction by being fully engaged in Krishna's service. And the example was given Arjuna, his fighting, doing it on the order of Krishna. All right, any comments on this? Any question? I was just thinking that, uh, you know, avoiding violence, like if you're going to work and, you know, there's protests in the city and you get stuck in the middle of it, or even when you're driving, you know, and uh, there's this road rage <laughs> uh, type of situation, you know, and people become violent because of it. Mm -hmm. In that situation, do we just, again, just remain peaceful and try to avoid those situations? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You have to control your emotions. Even if you kill mosquitoes, it's not really good. Prabhupada would tell the world, don't make my, don't make my room into a crematorium. And so, ma so many mosquitoes, killing all the mosquitoes. So, in the fifth canto, Srimad Bhagavatam, it talks about a hell for people who kill the innocent little creatures, even like bed bugs and things like that. There's a special hell for people to go there who kill all these innocent insects. So we have to be very careful. Okay, we'll go ahead. Next section we're going to hear about appreciating the deity. Would someone like to read? All right, sorry, a quick question please. On that last comment, yeah. What you know, in our temple, sometimes we get these rats and you know insects, and and, and the temple authorities order you know these fumigators to come in, and then you know these insects and rats they, they die. So you know, if it's causing a disturbance, then I mean, is there reactions for that? What happens in that situation? Mm, yeah, difficult. Difficult. Uh, I know one time in Hyderabad, they had some uh, food there and the rats somehow came and got it and the devotee said to Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, I'll put some rat poison down and kill them. And Prabhupada turned to the devotee and said, you should be killed. <laughs> and so, yes, rats come and different mice and things like that. Uh, we should be careful to keep everything very clean and don't leave food lying around and don't keep garbage laying around. Because when we have a lot of garbage ra laying around and food, la then it will attract the mice and rats. And so often we are responsible for these things. And one time I heard there was a cockroach in the kitchen and Prabhupada just knocked it out of the window and said, go outside and enjoy. <laughs> So that was Prabhupada's mood. Go outside. Go outside and enjoy. You can put a notice up. No mice and rats here. Go outside and enjoy. <laughs> All right. Appreciating deity. Someone read. There is a distinction in the. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you, there is a distinction in the manner a neophyte and an advanced devotee appreciate the Lord's presence in the temple. A neophyte considers the Arshvagre to be different from the original personality of Godhead. He considers it a representation of the Supreme Lord in the form of a deity. But an advanced devotee accepts the deity in the temple as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This is the vision of a deity, of a devotee whose devotional service is in the highest stage of bhava or the love of Godhead, whereas a neophyte's worship in the temple is a matter of routine duty. Okay. SB 3.29.164. So, deity worship can be done in the mode of passion, ignorance, passion, and goodness, right? What would, what would it be like if you're in the mode of ignorance, you're worshipping the deity? Could you give an example, Mariji? Uh, I'll, I'll ask for some favour from God, like I'm doing this, please give me this, this thing. That well, that's not the mode of ignorance, that's the mode of passion. Okay. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm not able to think. 
Mm? Someone help her? The, what would be deity worship in the mode of ignorance? Like um, living as a kind of burden. A grudging mood. A grudging mood, an angry mood, yeah. Maybe you, you get up, you don't take bath, you don't put tea like on even, you go on the altar and do the deity worship. And you, oh. and you put on old cloth, you, you don't put on clean cloth or something, you're laying down sleeping in your cloth, the same cloth you go on the altar and do deity worship. That's the mode of ignorance. Mm -hmm. We don't give proper attention. And deity worship in the mode of passion, Maharaji was saying, you may ask the Lord for something, or we want everyone, come and see me, I'm worshipping the deity, look how pious I am, I'm very religious. And what about deity worship in the mode of goodness? What would it be? What would uh, be? Yes, Maharaj, like we are doing the, for God's uh, pleasure. I mean, we are doing deity worship for God's pleasure. No, that's not, that's pure goodness. That's pure devotion when you do it for God's pleasure. What's in the mode of goodness? To get liberation or to get free from result of pious, uh, from karma? Yes, to get free of karma. And what was the other thing you said? Yes, to get liberation. Get... Sorry, couldn't hear you. As a sense of duty. Yes, as a sense of duty, that was one reason. And we are doing a, a devotion service in the morning, like attending Mangla Arati, that we ja, doing Japa, and so that is more of goodness. <laughs> Desiring for liberation. Yes, the desire for liberation, right. That is if you do have the desire, you want liberation, or you do it as a matter of duty, or you do it, what, what was the other reason we had? Yes, we had we had some more reason. Do, yes, what did you do, say? Doing, doing yes. the work as it's uh, thinking it's a pious activity to get rid of our bad karma, right? To get rid of our bad karma, we want to get rid of our karma. We want to get rid of our karma, and we do deity worship. We want maybe want liberation. Or we may just simply do it as a matter of duty. And we may even do it as an offering to Krishna. If we think, I'm offering this to Krishna, this is my offering to Krishna. That's not for Krishna's service. That's not the mode of pure devotion. Pure devotion, we simply want to please Krishna. We're not offering anything. We're simply doing service for Krishna. I want to give service for the pleasure of Krishna. Right? And here is talking about the neophyte. The neophyte, how does he see the deity? He thinks the deity, no, this is a deity. This is not God. This is not the personality of God. This is a deity. They make a distinction between the deity and the Supreme Lord. So the Supreme Lord is different. From their thinking is different. But the advanced devotee, they see this is the Supreme Lord. It's not just a deity, it's the Supreme Lord Himself who's come as in a deity form. No difference. That's the advanced devotee. All right? All right, someone like to read this for us? It is said by Vaishnava Association. It is said by Vaishnava Chakravati Thakur that even if one is a Vaishnava, if he is not of good character, his company should be avoided. Although he may be offered the respect of Vaishnava, anyone who accepts Vishnu as a Supreme Person of Godhead is accepted as Vaishnava. But a Vaishnava is expected to develop all the good qualities of the demigods. Yes. So Vaishnava should be of good character. You should have good qualities. Prabhupada was asked, how would we recognize a Hare Krishna devotee? He was on television in America and the men interviewed him. He said, how would I be able to recognize one of your devotees? And Prabhupada said, oh, he would be a perfect gentleman. In other words, he would have all good qualities, good character. 
So Prabhupada, anyone who accepts Vishnu as God, he is a Vaishnava. But he has to develop the good qualities. They have, we have to show that we're Vaishnava by the characteristics, by the qualities of the demigods. All the good qualities should be there. All right, who could read this one for us? The exact meaning of the word Satvena is given by Sridhara Swami as being synonymous with Dhairiana or Petience. One must perform devotional service with great patience. One shall not give up the execution of devotional service because one or two attempts have not been successful. One must continue. Shla Rupa Goswami also confirms that one should be very enthusiastic and execute the devotional service with patience and confidence. Patience is necessary for developing the confidence that Krishna will certainly accept me because I am engaging in devotional service. One has only to execute service according to the result and regulation to ensure su success. All right. Thank you, Prabhu. So patience, patience is necessary for developing this confidence that Krishna will accept me. It's going to take time. Just because one or two attempts have, been, have not been successful, we shouldn't be discouraged. And Prabhupada gives the example about the woman who gets married, she immediately wants a child. So it's going to take time. And so here we see also patience, that we, we should be utsahan, nischayat, dayariyat, right? Enthusiasm, patience and confidence. Very important qualities in order to develop our devotional service. So we have to be willing to uh, be patient and wait for Krishna to bestow his mercy on us. All right, qualities of a mudyama adhikari, the intermediate devotee. Someone read? The pure devotee should execute devotional service by giving the greatest respect to the spiritual master and the acharyas. He should be passionate to the poor and make friendship with the persons who are his equals. But all his activities should be executed under regulation and with control of the senses. Thank you. So the Majjama Adhikari, he makes distinction. He makes distinction between devotees and non-devotees. Here we see he's compassionate to the poor, makes friends, friendship with persons who are his equals. It doesn't mention here, it does not mention here about giving up the association of people who are demoniac or atheistic. But it mentions we should offer greatest respect to the spiritual master and the acharyas. So this is Lord Kapila, it's similar, it's similar to what's mentioned in the 11th canto where the Majjama Adhikari is uh, better described. This is Lord Kapila's explanation here. Respect to the Guru, the Acharya, and of course worship should be offered to the Supreme Lord. How to offer proper worship to the Supreme Lord? And we should respect not only the Supreme Lord in the deity form, but we should respect all living entities. So here, the Majjama Adhikari, he makes distinction. His compassion is directed to the poor, and he makes friends with persons who are his equals. Those who are not his equal, somebody is atheistic, or somebody is a blasphemer, we'll just avoid them. Majjama Adhikari also, his activities should be executed under regulation with control of the senses. This is an important part of sadhana bhakti, regulation and sense control. 
That's why temple program is very helpful for all of us. If you have a temple near you and you can be regulated, take part in the temple program. Right? So these are the four points which are brought about here. Madhyama Adhikari. We'll go ahead. Nira ahankriyaya, humility. Nira ahankriyaya, humility. The symptoms of a devotee are meekness and humility. Although spiritually very advanced, he always remains meek and humble. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught one should be humbler than the grass on the street more tolerant than the tree. One should not be proud or falsely puffed up. In this way one will surely advance in spiritual life. So devotees, they should be meek and humble. Vijabhinaya Sampani, right? In, in Bhagavad Gita the Brahmana is described Vijabhinaya Sampani Brahmani Gavihastin. Vidya Vinaya Sampani, Brahmani Gavihastini, Suni Chaiva Swapaki Chav, Samo Pandita Darshana. So the, the, pan, the Brahmana is described, Vidya Vinaya, learned and gentle. So here also, meek and humble. Amanitvam Adam Vitvam. In the 13th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes items of knowledge. And the first items of knowledge are humility and pridelessness. So here also, meek and humble, very important. And Prabhupada quotes Chaitanya Mahaprabhu from Shikshastikam. Our ego should be like the straw in the street. Remembering our, our spirit soul is one ten thousandth of the tip of the hair. And so our ego should be in proportion to the dimension of the soul, not in proportion to our body. If our ego is six foot tall, that's our ego is in proportion to our body. But when our ego is very small, it should be in proportion to the dimension of the, the soul. We should be very tolerant, tolerant like the tree, as the tree tolerates all conditions. So we should also tolerate. Okay, go ahead. Results of this practice. We need someone to read. When one, one, one is qualified with all the attributes, Prabhuji, please carry on. Go, go ahead, Madhuji, you read. Okay. When one is fully qualified with all the transcendental attributes and his consciousness is thus completely purified, he is immediately attracted simply by hearing my name or hearing of my transcendental quality. As the chariot of air carries an aroma from its source and immediately catches the sense of smell. Similarly, one who constantly engages in the devotional service in Krishna consciousness can catch the Supreme Soul, who is equally present everywhere. Hare Krishna. Okay, thank you. Yes. So this is the result of practicing Bhakti Yoga. We become attracted. We become attracted to hearing about Krishna. We get a taste for Krishna. And we feel the presence of Krishna everywhere in everything. Yes. There's another Mataji. You have to continue us a bit more here. Yes, Mataji. Um, as a breeze carrying a pre uh, pleasant fragrance from a garden of flowers, at once captures the organ of smell, so one's consciousness, saturated with devotion, can at once capture the transcendental existence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who in his par Paramatma feature is present everywhere, even in the heart of every living being. SB 3.29.20 Okay. Okay, so... No. Offenses, yes. Uh, respecting all living beings, 21-27. Uh, Offenses in Bhakti, 21-22. Uh, 
this uh, regard i am present in the heart of every living being as the super soul if one disregards my presence in all beings his worship of a deity is simply an imitation and is like offering oblations into the ashes yeah this is a very important point and this is often quoted I think it's mentioned also in the Bhagavad Gita in the purport one time I, I came across it before that the how how we worship the deity a person may give great attention to the worship of the deity but he doesn't have proper respect for the people in the temple he sees the, he sees the lord in the deity form but he doesn't see the lord in the heart of all the people and so this is disregard right so lord kapila is pointing out this point this is an this is a, these are offenses in bhakti that you may be on the altar worshiping the deity and you may not have the proper regard and proper respect for the people who are worshiping the deity who are outside the on in the temple room and so we have to see they are also souls and the lord is also in their heart and we have to have proper respect for them so lord kapila says if one disregards my presence in all beings then his worship is imitation just like offering oblations into the ashes what is the good of putting ghee on ashes you offer oblations into ashes it's useless and the same way you worship the deity but you don't see god in the heart of all the people it's very bad very wrong and this is an offense in bhakti it's another offense the second one go ahead maharaj ji yes maharaj offenses in bhakti 23 hatred the mind of such a separatist who worships me but hates other beings does not attain peace 24 criticism criticism i am not pleased with such a person who criticizes other beings even if he worships with proper rituals and paraphernalia so oh. paraphernalia paraphernalia yeah so this is very important section in this chapter about respecting other living beings so even though we may be worshiping the deity and you worship with all kinds of rituals and the proper paraphernalia but if we criticize people if we're critical of people then it's not pleasing to krishna so Uh, there are some nice examples of this. Uh, there was one of the Goswamis. I think it was Raghunath Bhatta Goswami. He would never hear any criticism of anyone. He would just change the subject, or he would just go away. When people want to criticize someone, don't hear it. Just go away. Don't listen to people cri being critical. It's it's not the proper mood of a devotee. So it, it goes on a lot, you know, because this is Kali Yuga. and people like to argue and quarrel with each other we criticize so we should be very cautious about this don't criticize people and don't hate people don't keep hate in your heart that's also very bad oh i hate that person well, this is really very bad and we must try to overcome these kind of emotions these feelings and understand their offenses in bhakti Okay so here's six kinds of offenses to a Vaishnava. First of all to blaspheme a Vaishnava. That's an offense. To not offer respectful obeisances upon seeing a Vaishnava is an offense. To not feel delight upon seeing a Vaishnava. We should feel so happy to see a devotee. We shouldn't think oh no here he comes oh my good oh. <laughs> and we want it. it's not good it's an offense. and to get angry with a vaishnava is also not good to think ill of a vaishnava to kill a vaishnava <laughs> yeah these are all offenses to devotees so we must be very cautious of these things four kinds of blasphemy to a vaishnava to blaspheme a vaishnava 
for his or her apparent low birth or caste. That is blasphemy. You criticize someone. Oh, that person, they're so low class, they're so low, you know. Oh, they're not, they're not, they, you know, they're sutra. There's people, they're chandalas, they're malachas, you know. We criticize them. That, so that's a blasphemy. Or to blaspheme a Vaishnava for some previous sinful activities prior to one's surrender to Krishna, that's also not good. You criticize someone, something they did before becoming a devotee. Or you criticize someone for some unpremeditated, accidental fall down. Well, they may do something just by chance, it was very, you know, they never did it before and they certainly won't do it again. We shouldn't criticize, it can happen to people. To blaspheme a Vaishnava for the last trace of his or her previous sins or faults that are almost rectified. So this is described for us in Harinam Chintamani. So respecting people, very important. If we criticize him, bear bad feelings towards him or hear him criticized, we are involved in Sadhu Nindana. Blaspheming a devotee incurs the anger of Krishna. So we have to respect everyone. Okay, coming back to Kapila Shiksha. Here's Lord Kapila. And how to respect all living beings? What do we need to do? We have to realize the presence of the Lord in everyone. That's how to properly respect them. See the Lord in everyone. Okay, who's, re who's going to read, Maharaji? Can you keep reading? Yes, Maharaj. Oh, uh, Kapila Shiksha Maharaj says, a devotee should try to understand everything in relationship with Krishna and try to serve everything in that spirit. To serve everything means to engage everything in the service of Krishna. If a person is innocent and does not know his relationship with Krishna, an advanced devotee should try to engage him in the service of Krishna. One who is advanced in Krishna consciousness can engage only, not only the living being, but everything in the service of Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay, so that's the point. Everything in relation to Krishna. Try to understand everything and try to serve everything in that manner. Nirbanda Krishna Sambande Yukta Vairagya Ujjati, right? Everything in the service of Krishna. Use everything in the service of Krishna. And what is not in for the service of Krishna, we don't need it. So to serve everything means to engage everything in Krishna's service. An innocent person doesn't know his relationship with Krishna. An advanced devotee should try to engage him in the service of Krishna. People come to our temple, we try to engage them in the service of Krishna. We will teach them to chant. When I first went to the temple, I remember the devotee said to me, he said, oh, he said, we're cleaning the temple today. Would you like to help? So I, I was a little surprised and I looked at him and he said, you know, when you, when you clean the temple, you're cleaning your heart. So I thought, oh, this sounds very mystical. I definitely want to do this. And Jai Pataka Swami, he describes when he first met devotees, they were building Rathyatra car. And they asked him, can you use a hammer? And so his first service was hammering nails in the Rathyatra car. So Prabhupada says here, one who, is in, one who is advanced in Krishna consciousness can engage not only the living being, but everything in the service of Krishna. All right? There was that, ex that example, uh, there was one Mayavadi sannyasi came and he had some pamphlets for his program and he gave out pamphlets to everyone. So Prabhupada thought, oh, this is very good. <laughs> everyone had the, the Mayavadi pamphlet. Prabhupada told everyone, yeah, keep it, keep it. And so then Prabhupada put prasadam on the piece of paper, the Mayavadi's pamphlet. Prabhupada served the prasadam on the piece of paper. And this way he made use of the, the pamphlet, the Mayavadi pamphlet. He put prasadam on it. 
Oh, sorry, wait, go back. All right. A devotee should not ignore any living entity. The devotee must know that in every living entity, however insignificant he may be, even in an ant, God is present. And therefore, every living entity should be kindly treated and should not be subjected to any violence. Mm -hmm. Yes. I remember one time we, we went with Prabhupada to a Hindu temple and they had big pictures of Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. So Prabhupada explained in his lecture, he said, a devotee of Krishna not only offers respects to Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva, he will offer his respect even to the tiny insect like an ant, because he sees Krishna in the heart of the insect. And another time Prabhupada called the devotee over, he said, do you see this insect on the table? I said, oh Prabhupada, I'm sorry, do you want me to get rid of it for you? Prabhupada said, I want you to think how to give it Krishna consciousness. So that is Krishna consciousness. We should be thinking, they're spirit souls, how to give them Krishna consciousness. Maharaj, can I ask a quick question, please? Okay. Okay, on this particular subject matter, you know, sometimes when you're preaching or, you know, you get into certain situations where, you know, people are following other faiths or other processes of religion and, and you know, they may end up insulting you or offending you. Um, and, and, you know, sometimes you can get into heated arguments, like I remember once in book distribution, we had a table at a shopping center. This one lady came and she said, you people are misleading the public, <laughs> you know, and sometimes uh, end up in the situation, um, sometimes you tend to kind of, you know, feel some enmity, uh, enmity towards the next individual. Uh, is that an offense to that person? And is that person causing an offense to you? Uh, is there any reactions for that? Or and as a Vaishnava, if we kind of maybe offend somebody, is there any kind of cause of action where we can <laughs> overcome that offense? Just those two parts of the question. Oh, well, that's a bit difficult for me to answer that question right now. That's, <laughs> that's a, uh, I, don't, I, I don't quite know the answer to that question, actually. It's complicated. Could be many issues involved. I, I will come back to that, Prabhu. I think I just want to leave that question for now. Let's go ahead with this section. At the end, we'll come back. If we have time, we can try to discuss that. Okay, so respecting all living beings. In modern civilized society, slaughterhouses are regularly maintained and supported by a certain type of religious principle. But without knowledge of the presence of God in every living entity, any so-called advancement of human civilization, either spiritual or material, is to be understood as being in the mode of ignorance. And so Prabhupada was aware of the standard of religion in the modern world today. That these different slaughterhouses maintained according to some religious principle. And so they have no knowledge of the presence of God. And sometimes when you give a lecture in a, a Christian school or something, they will say, well, there's a different soul in the animal. They think animal souls are different from human souls. And if they have a soul, it's like that. And, or they think animals are just there for us to eat. And they have this kind of philosophy. And of course they're influenced by Darwinism also. They think that everything, we've all evolved from the animals. They, they accept atheistic, godless theories like Darwinism, theory of evolution. Although they're supposed to be God-conscious people, they accept all kinds of atheistic philosophies. So this is going on in the material world, so much influenced by the mode of ignorance.
All right, text. This is text 24 purport. Similarly, we may offer many valuable items to the deity, but if we have no real sense of devotion and no real sense of the Lord's presence everywhere, then we are lacking in devotional service. In such a state of ignorance, we cannot offer anything acceptable to the Lord. So this is a powerful criterion which Srila Prabhupada is presenting to us through the teachings of Lord Kapila Dev, that we have to see the presence of the Lord in every living entity. Not only in every living entity, but the sense of the Lord's presence everywhere, in everything. So just making offerings to the deity is not enough, but we have to consider the real mood of devotion and the sense of appreciation for the Lord's presence. People may speak about devotion, they have devotion for the deity, but they have no proper respect for the devotees, no proper respect for the public who come to see the deity. So this is the mode of ignorance. And in that mood, the Lord will never accept our offerings. Okay, coming to Prasad distribution, who would like to read this for us? Prasad distribution. It is thought that one should create a temple in his private apartment or private room, offer something to the Lord, and then eat. One should exhibit his compassion for ignorant living entities by distributing prasad. Distribution of prasad to the ignorant masses of people is essential for the persons who are making offerings to the personality of God. Thank you. Yes, when we make offerings, offer to the deities, it's meant we're meant to also distribute. If we are simply keeping the deity in our home and we make our own private offerings and eat everything ourselves, then Prabhupada said that's only a little better than animal life. It's only a little better than animal life. You're only thinking of your own self. When we keep things, when we cook for the deity, we cook for the Lord, that means we should also distribute. And Prabhupada was always very eager to see prasadam distributed. He liked to see people take prasadam. One time Prabhupada was in Kenya. He was in Kenya and he saw there was one Sikh temple, I think it was a Sikh temple, and they were distributing prasadam. And they had, oh, they had it organized so well. All the people could come in and sit down and they were brought hot chapatis, freshly cooked, perfectly made chapatis, which, you know, which were well cooked and nice to eat. And they had a nice sabji as well to eat with the chapatis. And as soon as they ate, more was put on the plate. And in this way, people were sitting and they could eat as much as they wanted. And when Prabhupada saw it, he said, he said, oh, this is, this is real prasadam distribution. Prabhupada liked that so much. He liked to see that our movement would also distribute prasadam for the public. And that was why here in Mayapur, Prabhupada gave the order, no one should go hungry within, I think it's 10 kilometers of the temple. Of course, that was in the 1970s. Uh, when people were much poorer here, the economic situation has improved a lot since that time. But still we, we do, especially with this pandemic, we do a lot of prasadam distribution here. And it, it's very important for the public opinion. And I, I know in other parts of the world, devotees also are doing prasadam distribution. I think in England they have a very successful prasadam distribution program, isn't it?
Yes, Maharaj, it's quite... Yeah, there's one devotee called Parashuram. He's quite well known in the UK and other places in the world. He has a massive food distribution program. Massive? Yeah, well, not as much as in my poor thousands and thousands, but every day he's uh, distributing food. Every uh, he, what he does he, is he gets donations from the various supermarkets. The uh, items have gone out of date and they phone him and he covers all everything, makes big bashad and distributes it. Oh. How many vehicles do they have distributing? Well, he has, um, he has about four or five. He has these little carts, these little um, carts or kind of free world carts that he and he's got devotees. They then take it to the different universities in uh, central London. On the cart? Yeah, yeah. Really? They have a cart? Yeah. Is yeah it's it like a free wheeled um, bike with a big with some boxes on the back that are, where he keeps the bashad on the hole. Is, is it motorized? No, it's, um, well, one of them is battery. The one of them, they have, you know, these battery driven bikes. Oh, it's battery. Electric. Battery, uh huh. Yeah. And they have, it they have something to keep it hot also. Yeah, yeah. They keep in these special containers that keeps really warm and hot. Oh, special containers to keep it warm, okay. Yeah. yeah. And the students love it because. Um, they get free bashad, it's all free. <laughs> oh, they mainly focus on students, do they? Yeah, students, but it's also to homeless people as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, nice. That's a big job. And all the way from the manor, they have to drive into London? No, well, it's, it's, it's done in a separate place. Um, Parashurampu has a separate kitchen, which is separate, which is not at the manor. He was based at the manor, but he outgrew the manor. <laughs> now he has his own place. Oh, he has his own place. Okay, okay. It's somewhere in London, huh? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. So, prasadam distribution and, and you know, <laughs> very, very important. The heart of the temple is the kitchen. If you have good prasadam, then there will always be people coming to the temple. And the prasadam is really, really important. You want people to come to the temple, you have to have prasadam. And Prabhupada also wrote a letter before he left the world. He had a letter written and sent to all the temples, telling them they have to distribute prasadam. And they said you should always have prasadam ready at the temple. When people come, there should be prasadam there for them. And you cannot say, oh, there's nothing. There's no he said, Krishna is not a poor man. He said, you have to have prasadam, you have to distribute it to people. Okay, so two kinds of charity, mana and dana. Mana, respect, is offered to a superior and charity, dana, is offered to an inferior. So two different kinds of charity, right? You give to the superior mana and you give dana to an inferior. Now we're going to hear about the different grades of living entities. There are different levels of living entities. Uh, we are taught to respect all living entities, but at the same time we should understand there's different levels of living entities, not that they're all equal. Just like we may embrace, we embrace the devotee and we're happy to see the devotee, we couldn't do that with the tiger. You couldn't do that with the cobra, these kind of creatures, you know. We have to understand the difference between different types of living entities. So, uh, this is text 28. Living entities are superior to inanimate objects, O Blessed Mother. And among them, living entities who display life symptoms are better. Animals with developed consciousness are better than them. And better still are those who have developed sense perception. That's text number 28. Would someone like to read text number 29 to 33 for us? Do you have a book there? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, would you like to read for us, Maharaj? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. 
Among the living entities who have developed sense perception, those who have developed the sense of taste are better than those who have developed only the sense of touch. Better than them are those who have developed the sense of smell and better still are those who have developed the sense of hearing. Text 30. Better than do, uh, those living entities who, are, uh, who can perceive sound are those who can distinguish between one form and another. Better than them are those who have developed upper and lower sets of teeth and better still are those who have many legs. Better than them are the quadrupeds and better still are the human beings. Text 31. Among human beings, the society which is divided accordingly to uh, quality and work is best. And in that society, the intelligent men who are uh, designated as Brahmanas are best. Among the Brahmanas, one who has studied the Vedas is the best. And among the Brahmanas who have studied the Vedas, one who knows the actual purport of Veda is the best. Text 32. Better than the Brahmana who knows the purpose of the Vedas is he who can dissipate all doubts and better than him is one who strictly follows the Brahmanical principles. Better than him is one who is liberated from all material uh, contamination and better than him is a pure devotee who executes devotional service without expectation of reward. Uh, text 33 Therefore, I do not find a greater person than he who has no interest outside of mine and who therefore engages and dedicates all his activities and all his life, everything, onto me without cessation. Thank you very much, Mahati. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Alright, so we see the different grades, particularly among the Brahmanas there. Mm. Right, okay, so here mentioned, we must treat the living being, the, we must treat the lower living entities compassionately. But this does not mean that we have to treat them in the same way we treat other human beings. The feeling of equality must be there, but the treatment should be discriminating. Just how discrimination should be maintained is given in the following six verses concerning the different grades of living conditions. So we heard this, we heard the six verses about the different people. Hmm? Okay, going ahead, this is Lord Kapila's conclusions, text number 34. Such a perfect devotee offers respects to every living entity because he is under the firm conviction that the Supreme Personality of Godhead has entered the body of every living entity as the super soul or controller. All right, so it's such a perfect devotee. We heard text 33, we heard about the perfect devotee who is completely dedicated to the service of Krishna and he sees everyone, everything in relation to the Lord. So here we see the perfect devotee, he offers respects because he, th he knows the Lord is in that body. He's there as the super soul. And then text 35. My dear mother, O daughter of Manu. Right? Devahuti is the daughter of Swayambhuva Manu. And she'd been married to Kardama Muni. Her father had uh, taken her there to the forest and left her there in the forest with Kardama Muni. Then later on, Kadama Muni 
created this aerial mansion and they went and enjoyed and they enjoyed their householder life. Then they had the children and then Kardama Muni left home and he left her with Lord Kapila and Lord Kapila is instructing her. So Lord Kapila is instructing his mother. He knows his mother was the daughter of Manu and he tells her, a devotee who applies the science of devotional service and mystic yoga in this way can achieve the abode of the Supreme Person simply by that devotional service. So we simply have to apply the science of devotional service and you can go back to Godhead. Apply this process, bhakti yoga. And it mentions also mystic yoga, and this way you can achieve the abode of the Lord. We can go back to Godhead. We just follow this process. Text 36. This Purusha, whom the individual soul must approach, is the eternal form of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is known as Brahman and Paramatma. He is the transcendental chief personality and his activities are all spiritual. So this Purusha, meaning the enjoyer within the body, there's the, the real Purusha is the Supreme Lord. We, we think, the living entity thinks he's the Purusha, where that is our mistake, that we're thinking we're the enjoyer. Actually, there's only one Purusha, and that is the Supreme Lord. Hey Krishna Maharaj, may I ask one question? Yes. Uh, Maharaj, here in the uh, second one, uh, 3.29.35, uh, mystic yoga is mentioned. So, uh, significance of mystic yoga, I am unable to understand, Maharaj. Well, remember we were told that Sankhya Yoga was a process of devotional service along with meditation on the super soul. So it, it could be simply referring to that. It's, it's never made very clear to us what is, actually, what is actually meant by this mystic yoga. It could simply be the meditation on the super soul, the Lord in the heart. It could be seeing the Lord everywhere in everything. It could also be the it, it, it could be the recognizing the different gradations of the living entities. Yes, ma'am. We just we just don't get a clear, you know. No, it's, I haven't seen a text anywhere where it says mystic yoga is you do this, you know. <laughs> so what yes, what exactly is the mystic yoga? We just understand that the devotional service is somehow connected with mystic yoga. Yes, Maharaj, because in mystic yoga, we concentrate on the, uh, meditate on the super soul. That also is uh, told in Bhagavad Gita as incomplete realization of the Supreme Personality of God. So that way, actually, we see the definition of yoga, uh, Dhyan Yoga, uh, which is basically meditating on the Paramatma in the heart. So that is incomplete and devotional service, of course, complete realization of the God. So maybe what you are saying is, uh, I think uh, we have to understand like gradation of different living entities and seeing the Lord in every living entity. Yes. And we also understand, you know, the process of the mystic yoga meditation on the super soul, that it brings you to samadhi and once you come to the samadhi, then you take up devotional service and you actively engage in the service of the Lord. It's not that everything stops. So the, the meditation on the super soul can be part of the process to bring us to take up active engagement because if one's, if one's realization is complete, then we realize that we are not the super soul, we are the servant of the super soul, and we engage in the service of the super soul. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, may I ask a question? Yes. Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, so we mean to say in mystic yoga, you come to a mode of goodness to attain the super soul. Is it like that? I'm a little confused. 
Can you say that again? Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, can you say that in Mystic Yoga, one comes to the uh, mode of goodness so that he can, um, you know, to enter the pure uh, devotional service? Well, definitely, you're going to enter devotional service. You want to come up to the mode of goodness, then then you want to transcend even the mode of goodness. Yes. So, can we say that uh, mystic yoga helps us to come into the mode of goodness? That way, is it? Well, again, it will depend on the practitioner. You may do mystic yoga, but you may be influenced by tam tamagun and rajagun. <laughs> We don't know. Just as bhakti yoga, the, the person doing bhakti can be influenced by the lower modes. So the person who does mystic yoga, he could also be influenced by the lower modes. Uh, Maharaj, can you give an example? Well, mystic yogis, we see sometimes the yogis, they become angry and they curse. You know, we see Durvasa Muni, you know, how he dealt with Maharaj Ambarish, you know, there was, it was really not very good, you know, what he did. Sometimes he gets involved in these things, quarrels with devotees, right? Do you know the story of Maharaj Ambarish and Durvasa Muni? Durvasa Muni was angry. He wanted to curse Maharaj Ambarish. He created the demon. And so, so sometimes yogis, they have that tendency, mystic yogis, and sometimes they want yoga powers also. Something mystic yogi, they want to get the yoga power, the, the yoga power to control the universe. So these are some problems. So they fall down uh, many a times. Well, yeah, it can be a problem if it's not connected with devotional service. So it's mentioned here, devotional service and mystic yoga. So the yoga is combined with devotional service. So when it's combined with devotional service, then it's not a problem. Mm. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, much. Okay, then text number 30, this Purusha. So they're talking about not the Supreme Purusha, but the living entity. So the living entity, the individual soul must approach, this Purusha whom the individual soul must approach, in other words, we have to approach the eternal form of the Supreme Lord, who is Brahman, Paramatma and Bhagavan. He is the transcendental personality. So we are the Purusha, we are the individual soul, but our duty is to understand there is a Supreme Soul, there is a Supreme Lord, and we have to approach Him and surrender to Him. All right, then coming to the last question of Devahuti in this section, she wants to know about time, the time factor. Time is actually the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the enjoyer of all sacrifices, the master of all masters. Hmm? We see Krishna in the form of time, the time factor which causes the transformation of the various material manifestations is another feature of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Anyone who does not know that time is the same Supreme Personality is afraid of the time factor. <laughs> are you afraid of time factor? If we're, af if we're afraid of time, are we afraid of becoming old? Are we afraid of death? That's because we don't know Krishna. We, are, we should understand time is the same Supreme Personality, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the time factor. It's a form of the Lord. Oh, no. Okay, so the, all of these points are here. The main philosophical concepts which are introduced in this chapter. First of all, one should follow the principles of devotional service with no desire, including becoming liberated. A devotee doesn't have any material desire, he doesn't even desire liberation. What does he want to do? His only desire? To please the Supreme Lord. He wants to give pleasure to the Lord, that is all. This is called pure devotional service. So that was the lesson. 
from the first section. And then, second part, one should execute his prescribed duties and one's devotional service, devotional activities regularly. This spontaneous attraction to Krishna's name, quality and pastimes develop from practicing pure devotional service. So the point was made that devotional service should be regular, it should be uninterrupted, right? Without, it should be ahaita ki apratiyata, unmotivated, uninterrupted, 24-7, right? We say 24-7, 24, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, no days off, not even a minute off, every moment for Krishna's service, everything done for Krishna, that is pure devotion. Number three, one should respect all living entities as Krishna, as the Super Soul is within everyone's heart. Respecting the living entities as Krishna doesn't mean that they're all God and we worship them, but we understand that Krishna is in their heart and they are a part and parcel of Krishna. I, I told you, Prabhupada said, we offer our respects even to the insects, the ant, because Krishna is in their heart. Number four, one must approach the super soul, the Lord in the heart, for life, for he is the supreme controller, the time factor and the goal of yoga. We have to approach the super soul. So meditation on the super soul that was taught earlier, how to practice yoga, concentrate, contemplate the super soul. We heard the description of the super soul. Remember all the different bodily limbs, meditate on the different limbs of the Lord. And in this way, concentrate on the super soul. In this way, purify the heart. And that super soul is in the heart of all living entities. And he is also the time factor and the goal of yoga. And then the fifth item, knowledge, as knowledge of time as Lord Vishnu's energy impels one to understand the all-devouring effect of time and detach one from material activities. Uh, in the third canto, you'll remember at the beginning of the third canto, we heard about uh, Vidura and Maitreya and Uddhava. Uddhava came to, uh, Vidura approached, first of all, Uddhava. He wanted to hear about the Lord and particularly he wanted to hear about the Lord, how he appeared and then disappeared from the world. And it was described about the annihilation of the Yadu dynasty. And so that annihilation of the Yadu dynasty helps to create detachment from the material world. In the same way, when we hear about the devouring effects of time, it helps us to understand the temporary nature of the material world and helps us to give up our attachment and over-identification with this world. So that's very important for us. Devahuti had asked about that, she wanted to understand the effects of time, and we'll hear more about that when we go into the next chapter. All right, are there any, are there any questions? Oh, there's a final quote here. Samyak kayate, complete knowledge. First of all, there was vibration. Then, from vibration, there was sky, creation, beginning of creation. And then from sky, there was sound. Then from sound, there was air. Then from air, there was electricity or fire. Then from electricity, there was water. And from water, there is land. This is shortly described. Then how this mind is created, intelligence is created, how the controller is created. So it is not that we are simply chanting and dancing. 
That is the ultimate goal of life. But we know this creation has taken place, how it is being maintained, how it will be annihilated, what will happen after annihilation. Everything we know by this Sankhya philosophy. This is from Srimad Bhagavatam, 1st Canto, 3rd Chapter, Verse 10, a lecture given by Srila Prabhupada in September 1972. All right, are there any questions? Yes, Maharaj, may I ask? Yes, Prabhu. Uh, this is related to the uh, previous chapter, uh, text, uh, the ch chapter 28, uh, in the last class we discussed, uh, like, text 41. There are uh, four uh, Vaishnava philosophic do doctrines. So, in the text, uh, in the purport, I saw that four, out of four, the meanings of the two doctrines are specified, the meaning of the two other doctrines, they are not specified. The meanings? Yes, well, Vaishnava philosophic doctrines, uh, they are mentioned in text 41, uh, chapter 28. Yes. Well, how does it describe the two of them? Yeah, that actually uh, I will just say. Yes, actually uh, in the uh, two of them uh, it is mentioned uh, that uh, one is Shuddha Adwait, purified oneness. Uh, the uh -huh. second one is Dvait, Advait, uh, simultaneous oneness and difference, and Vishishta, Advait and Dvait. Okay. So these four actually I could not understand because purified oneness, simultaneous oneness and difference, and Vishishta, Advait and Dvait. Oh yeah, Vishishta, Dvait and Dvait. Uh, so, uh, one is... One is from Ramanuja Sampradaya, right? Vishista Dvaita. Vishista Dvaita is Ramanuja Sampradaya, Sri Vaishnavas. Okay. Yeah. So, what is mean actually? Uh, Shuddha Dvait, uh, Dvait, Vish Dvait. Vishista Dvaita means uh, purified oneness. Purified oneness, but that is mentioned as Shuddha Dvait. Oh, is it? Shuddha Dvait? Yes. yes. Vashista Dwait, Shuddha Dwait. I'll have to look in my notes to see what that is. Okay, Maharaj. I have it in my notes. Uh, purify. I thought Vashista Dwait is purified. I, anyway, and one is. Uh, oh, Shuddha Dwait, purified one. That's. Uh, Oh, that's going... Anyway, I have it in my notes. Uh, I'll, I'll give you, if you want, you can... I'll send it to you on email or something. You give me your email and I'll send you. You want to know. I found... I checked all that before when I did these questions. I answered all those things. So I have it in my notes. I just... So how, do I, how do I share my mail ID? Maharaj, if you can share with me, I will... Uh, okay, I'll give to Padma Sundari and she can fast to everyone. And, and Maharaj, okay, thank you Mataji, thank you uh, Maharaj. And Maharaj, in the last class, I also requested some help for the uh, principal incarnation for the Satyur. Oh, the different names. The principal incarnation for the Satyur, uh, because uh, the, you mentioned that Karmajan Muni was telling uh, Nimi Maharaj in Canto 11. There are certain names, but I looked into it and I found that only the color of the uh, incarnation is mentioned as white. Really? Yes, Maharaj. Okay, so I'll look into it. And I... in the last class, Maharaj, you also explained about the potency of the sound uh, with reference to bondage, material bondage. And I tried to read it three, four times, but I still could not understand. And you mentioned that sound is, and you also sent uh, some presentation which basically uh, depicted the uh, significance of the sound on the water molecules. Yes. Like, yeah. So I looked into it, but how the sound is creating bondage? It is basically uh, some kind of like uh, desire for sense enjoyment. Like if some, like in the Srila Prabhupada purport, it is mentioned if somebody wants to build a size skyscraper, then he has to associate with somebody who has the knowledge to mix the 
different ingredients like earth, metal, and uh, rocks, and then they can combine in a certain way and then build skyscraper for it. So he has to hear from somebody who is knowledgeable how to build a skyscraper from the available ingredients. Sound is bondage, certainly. If you hear a lot of Gramya Kata, Gramya Kata, you hear a lot of nonsense talk. Nonsense talk breeds nonsense thought. Nonsense thought breeds nonsense actions. And nonsense actions breeds old age, disease and death. That's a bondage. Okay, basically nonsense uh, thoughts, they, it leads to nonsense. Uh, Nonsense talk need, leads to nonsense thought, and nonsense thought leads to nonsense actions, and that leads to birth, old age, disease, and death. Okay, understood, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. Any other question? Prabhu, that question which you had earlier, which I didn't answer, you want to come up with it now? Again, tell me again. Okay, uh, right. So basically, you know, regarding that section respecting all living entities. So sometimes we come across uh, situations where, uh, you know, you're amongst a group of people where there's contrasting views on religion. Uh, and sometimes you, you know, you are insulted or minimized in terms of your belief in terms of the uh, Vaishnava philosophy. So, you know, sometimes they would criticize you and that's fame. This is, I'm talking in relation to uh, living entities, not Vaishnavas now. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, sometimes also when they mention this, you build some animosity towards them as well, because there is some anger that can develop. So you would maybe sometimes end up criticizing them. Uh, and I cited that one example, like when we were at a uh, shopping mall distributing books, one person came and said, you people are misleading the public, you know. Um, so, I wanted to get some clarity in the sense that, you know, each person is criticizing each other. Uh, are there any offenses on either party's side, from the devotee's side and the other living entity's side? And if there is, how do we overcome that? Because now when we talk about Vaishnava, Raj, it's more related to the living entities. Well, the devotee, we should try to come to the Madhyam level. Certainly you're going out there on a table, you've got a book table out there and you're, you're, you're doing some preaching work. You want to be like a Madhyam Adhikari. So somebody is, you know, blasphemer comes up with a very challenging statement. What do you do? You just avoid them. You just, stay, you, just you don't talk with them. There's no benefit to it. Because they're atheistic or they're blasphemers, you know, they're, they're very challenging, you definitely don't want to get into an argument with them and just say, I, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have time to discuss with you, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to discuss with you. Because if you do, they'll just, come, they'll just become more blasphemous. You're going to argue with them and they'll become more and more offensive and it will be very bad. And so you don't help them, you don't help yourself. So it's better not to talk with them. Madhyama Adhikari makes distinction who he's going to talk to and who he's going to try to distribute. He gives mercy to the innocent and he will avoid the blasphemers and the, those who are antagonistic and challenging and so on, offensive. Okay? Okay. But Maharaj, you know, if, if uh, one hasn't taken that position of coming to the Madhyam level, you know, but he, and so he does end up he or she does end up, you know, criticizing. Uh, are there reactions? And, and well, there can be, yeah, you people? can get reactions for it, yes. And so we, we definitely want to be careful in dealing with other people. Definitely, if we're not, if we don't deal with them properly, we will we'll get some reactions. Um, Prabhupada, one time Prabhupada was giving a lecture and a man, a man was listening to the lecture and sudden, suddenly he stood up and he really yelled and screamed at Prabhupada and then he walked out. And Prabhupada said, I must have offended him in my previous life. And so, you, you know, you, you get involved in arguments and stuff with people, it, it, you know, it doesn't help us. 
We cert certainly want to avoid these kind of situations. And you're going out on a book table, you've got to come to that Madhyama level. You've got to be Madhyama. You've got to make distinction. You've got to know when to talk and when to keep quiet. And sometimes it doesn't pay to talk. Sometimes you have to just keep quiet. And let them just do their, say their blasphemy and then they'll go away. All right? Okay. Maharaj, uh, yeah, just one last aspect or question on that. Uh, so, if it does happen, uh, what does one repent or how does one ask forgiveness for, you know, doing that type of, uh, or engaging in that type of conversation and offending someone, being critical of someone? No, well, we get, we, we, we overcome these offences by engaging in just constant chanting of the holy name and shedding tears and regretting that uh, I shouldn't have done like that, I should, I should be more compassionate, I should be more tolerant. So repentance, I think that's the best way. All right, any other any other question? Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, may I ask a question? Please, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, if I have some illness and because of that, I'm not able to do my devotional service properly. So, uh, if I'm asking God, uh, God, Lord, please help me in uh, curing my illness so that I can do my devotional service properly. So, is it a more of passion? Um, am I in more of passion or in goodness? What, what are you speak? doing? Like, suppose if I'm ill and I'm asking Lord, that, uh, Lord, I'm not able to do my devotional service properly, please cure me of that so that I can, you know, perform better, in a better way. You know? Is it, a, am I in more of passion or... Uh, no, like, no. Okay, so is it okay? It's okay. And uh, Maharaj, uh, second question is, like, if I have some uh, problem with a devotee, like, if uh, someone is doing, uh, but he's not correct, and uh, so, in that case, what should I do? I mean, should I, you know, keep a distance or should I, you know, uh, I mean... Uh, well, it's a devotee. I... They're a devotee. So, we should be respectful in dealing with them. And, yeah. and maybe, uh, you know, you can, you can go, you can try to serve them in some way. Yes, and try to, them. try to do some service for them in some way. Yes, Maharaj. Like, if we serve them, then also if, if they do something, you know, which is not proper, so what should we do in that way? We should okay. we should be tolerant. Tolerant. Yes, we should tolerate. We should think, I must have done something in the past to deserve this. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. We say an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. If you follow that, that's no good. You'll go blind. Everybody will be blind. <laughs> Everyone will have no teeth. And so, we don't follow that. We tolerate. Somebody does something bad to us, okay, thank you, Krishna. My karma is less. We're getting rid of our karma. <laughs> yes, Maharaj, but sometimes it happens that we, uh, we keep on tolerating and we, you know, in that we get ill. In that way. What should we do in that way? Like, so we're not able to do our devotional services properly. So how should we handle this? Well, you have to take care of your health. You have to keep healthy. <laughs> you know, I don't think they can harm your health, you know. Not the, we, yeah, the, the body, material body will always give us trouble. But Prabhupada said the illness and old age are an impetus for our devotional service. The more we struggle in devotional service, that is the, that is the, that's a, our greatest devotional service. The more we are having to struggle to do devotion. Mm, even though we're sick, we try to, we have to do some devotion. We have to do some kind of devotion. Find something to do. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, we try to, try to chant, you try to hear. You can, even you're sick, you can be hearing, you can be trying to chant. So try. We have to, the devotional service has to go on. Yeah, my, Maharaj, my question is, like, suppose if a person, if you feel that the devotee is not doing correct, I mean, it is our karma only, we are not blaming him or her, 
but like because of that our uh, i mean we're not able to concentrate in devotional service so what should we do in that case and we are disturbing our health because of that you're not you know? able to cut that it's your problem you have to control your mind you have to get your mind control you have to chant you have to do more chanting loud chanting you have to control your mind yes ma'am we have and you're sick okay then you have to hear do more hearing you, and you can read you take advantage that's an opportunity to yes, come Master. to come closer to krishna yes ma'am okay thank you much hari krishna thank you any other question anyone else has a question No. Karuna Prabhu, do you have a question? Have you just no, asked? No, I just asked. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Well, so you have a holiday tomorrow? And then you have closed book next Saturday. And I'll be back on Sunday then. Next week, next Sunday. Not this Sunday. This Sunday you have a holiday. You have to catch up. Okay, so thank you all very much. So we'll see you after a week or more, eight days. Take care. Stay healthy. I hope. Pray to Krishna. Protect all of you. And we'll see you all after eight days. Hare Krishna. Shri Prabhupada ki. Yeah.